Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh. Three weeks is a long time on the battlefield. Ukraine, which for the first six months of the war had been outgunned and outranged by the superior Russian artillery, has staged a spectacular fight back. Military analysts have described the Ukrainian counter-offensive as a blitzkrieg that has effectively pulled the rug from under the feet of the Russian war machine. If reports are to be believed, then Ukraine in the last fortnight has managed to retake as much as 6,000 square kilometers of territory from around the Kharkiv region, which Russia had occupied. It has managed to achieve this with the help of the Western supplied weapons like the HIMARS. superior intelligence and smart precision guarded weapons delivered by drones. This is what the map of Ukraine looked like on the 1st of September. And this is what it looks like now. The battle lines that have been frozen have now started to shift dramatically. And this time, the battle lines are moving eastwards. Western military analysts claim that Russia has suffered a rout. While Russia insists that it has only fallen back to regroup and consolidate. Even the Chechen leader, Ramzan Kadyrov, whose troops are on the front lines, has been forced to admit that the war is not going Russia's way. But perhaps the biggest indicator that the war has suffered for Moscow has come from the Russian president himself. Vladimir Putin has now ordered for what he has described as the partial mobilization of 300,000 reservists. You must hear that again, Vladimir Putin is now mobilizing a force of 300,000 reservists for his Ukraine war. To protect our motherland, its sovereignty and territorial integrity, to ensure the security of our nation and people at the liberated territories, I consider it's necessary to support the defense ministries and general staff's proposals to hold partial mobilization in Russia. This is clear admission that Russia is on the back foot. It also points to an upping of ante, but the Russian president didn't stop there. He went a step further, and some would say he went a step too far. To those who allow themselves such statements regarding Russia, I want to remind you that our country also has various means of destruction, and for separate components and more modern than those of NATO countries, and when the territorial integrity of our country is threatened to protect Russia and our people, we will certainly use all the means at our disposal. This is not a bluff. Vladimir Putin is a man who chooses his words carefully. And if he is threatening to call the nuclear bluff, then absolutely no one should be under any doubt that what a cornered Vladimir Putin is threatening is a nuclear Armageddon. The call for mobilization had an immediate reaction domestically in Russia. Widespread protests against conscription resulted in nearly about 1,300 protesters getting arrested. Long queues were witnessed at the Russian borders with Finland, Georgia and Kazakhstan. But Kremlin insists that these reports of an exodus of men of fighting age are vastly exaggerated. With the onset of winter, the battle lines in Ukraine will freeze again. The war of attrition has now turned into a test of superior weapons, superior intelligence and superior resolve. Russia is throwing everything it has and the kitchen sink at Ukraine. This video that's been put out by the Ukrainian Defense Forces is from the city of Bakhmut, which Kiev claims has been completely devastated by the Russians. Earlier there were accusations that Russia may have used white phosphorus in Ukraine, but it turns out that Russia has been raining its 9M22C shells to gain an upper hand in certain regions. In this video from the recently recaptured village of Ozerne by Ukraine, the Russians dropped the incendiary shells that are used to destroy an enemy's manpower and equipment by creating mass fires and also by direct hits. Russia is also changing the facts on the ground by conducting referenda in the captured provinces of Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson and Zaporizhia. The war is poised at a very delicate moment. Ukraine appears to have tipped the balance in its favor. But the Russians claim that they've held themselves back from using their heavier weapons and air force which would have otherwise overwhelmed the Ukrainian forces. Russia is waiting for the chill to set in 
so that it can unleash its most decorated general winter onto Europe. But Ukraine will try and do everything that it can to recover as much territory as it can before the snow begins to fall. While the blood of thousands of people has been spilled on the battlefield, the honchos of the weapons manufacturing companies have been laughing their way to the bank. This is the irony that not many in media seem to be reporting on. This is the business of war which lines the pockets of companies and their CEOs who rake in billions of dollars by manufacturing weapons that are designed to kill effectively and devastate as large an area as possible to snuff out lives. I'll give you a recent example. As soon as the Russian President Vladimir Putin, in his address to the nation, announced a mobilization of 300,000 reservists, weapons manufacturers were cheering and clapping. Consider this, on the 21st of September, when Russian President Vladimir Putin made his address to the nation, the shares of Britain's biggest defense manufacturer, Bay Systems, shot up by 4.7% in the immediate aftermath of this escalation. The stocks of the Chemering Group went up by about 2.1%, while Thales, the French defence manufacturer, saw its stock prices go up by over 5% in the immediate aftermath of the announcement. On the American defence manufacturing front, the shares of Lockheed Martin, Raytheon Technologies and Northrop Grumman also popped and scaled new highs. For the defence companies, this is boom time. Business and profits have perhaps never been this good. But what these merchants of death never think about is the suffering and the faces of those who get crushed under their manufactured weapons and explosives. Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, the two former Soviet republics, share a 1,000 kilometer long border. But more than a third of this border is disputed. On the 14th of September, hostilities broke out between the two nations as they resorted to heavy shelling and also moved their forces into an attack formation for a bigger, impending conflict. Eventually, after two days, the two sides agreed to a ceasefire under international pressure. But what is this conflict all about? And why does the border between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan threaten to become a major flashpoint in the geopolitics of Central Asia? Our next report gets you more details. This is the deadliest conflagration that has broken out between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan in decades. Over a hundred people have reportedly been killed and over 140,000 have been internally displaced. There are conflicting reports on how the hostilities broke out, but according to the Kyrgyz Ministry of Foreign Affairs, this was a planned act of aggression by the Tajik forces, who were accompanied by irregular paramilitary groups. Just 504 kilometers of the border between the two nations has been clearly demarcated. Kyrgyzstan also hosts two Tajik enclaves of Voruk and Keragach. And the two nations have been engaged in repeated skirmishes, as each uses different Soviet-era maps and agreements to claim territory. During the day at around 7.20 a.m., the Tajik side opened fire on our frontier outpost, and we took up defense over there, as you can see, by those walls there. Every one of our border guards was guarding the Maksad border outpost. This video that has since gone viral on social media shows the Tajik forces blowing up a 36-meter bridge over the Aksu River. The airport at the Kyrgyz town of Batken, too, was attacked. In a span of less than 48 hours, the period for which the two sides exchanged heavy fire, several neighborhoods in the border villages were completely destroyed. We didn't know what was going on. They just started shooting. It was impossible to stand there. The houses burned down there. Everything burned down. Whatever I had at home, they stole everything. Almost 90 resident homes burned down. In the Kyrgyz capital of Bishkek, there were immediate protests. Hundreds of young men gathered in front of the Kyrgyz parliament, demanding answers as to how the Kyrgyz forces had been caught off guard against Tajik aggression. Eventually, the Kyrgyz president, Sadar Japarov, was forced to issue a statement. 
All government services are currently working hard and taking care of the recovery of compatriots affected by the events of the border clashes. Thank God our coffers are not empty. The state has enough forces to fully provide for the needs of soldiers and citizens forced to relocate due to the situation. Under international pressure, the guns have fallen silent at the Tajik-Kyrgyz border. Except for some sporadic shelling, the ceasefire has by and large held. But with no clear agreement over the border, it is only a matter of time before more hostilities break out. In Iran, a 22-year young woman, Mehsa Amini, ended up losing her life after she was detained by Iran's notorious morality police for not wearing her hijab appropriately and was also reportedly beaten and tortured, eventually leading to her death. And this has sparked widespread unrest. Thousands of women and men have taken to the streets of Iran in open defiance of the Iranian government and also the morality police. Our next report gets you more details. This is an unprecedented moment in Iran. Protests against compulsory hijab have taken place before, but nothing compares to the resolve and open defiance that Iranian women and men have displayed in recent days against the strict hijab rules in the country. In this video from the city of Sari in northern Iran, women danced and threw their headscarves into a bonfire. In Tehran's Amir Kaber University, Students marched and shouted slogans condemning the government and the notorious morality police. So what sparked this unrest? On the 13th of September, 22-year-old Iranian Kurdish woman Mahasa Amini was detained for not wearing her headscarf appropriately. According to reports, she was hit on the head with a baton and was tortured by the morality police which made her slip into a coma. Three days later, this healthy young woman, who was so full of life, died for not having worn her hijab appropriately. The outrage was immediate, first in the Kurdish-dominated neighborhoods and then across Iran. Young Iranian women defied the hijab laws by publicly taking off their headscarves. On social media, Iranian women expressed their dissent by posting videos of themselves chopping off their hair. The Iranian women received support from members of the Iranian diaspora from far-flung cities such as Istanbul, Berlin and Toronto. <laughs> It's a revolution that has started with the murder of a young Iranian woman and it will not end so easily. Many of my friends are in prison or have been killed or have had to leave their homeland because of the hijab issue. In Iran, women are suppressed. These are the worst protests that Iran has witnessed in years. A combination of factors are at play. Excesses by the morality police, galloping inflation, and the dire situation of Iran's economy due to sanctions and international isolation. Masa Amini's death appears to have been the last straw that broke the camel's back. Masa Amini is not the only woman who has been rounded up and brutalized by the morality police. In recent years, there have been repeated instances like this, where the morality police have resorted to heavy-handed measures to enforce its obscure understanding of the law. People have been killed in the protests so far. Iran has responded to the protests by deploying its anti-riot police and by suspending internet and imposing curbs on social media sites like WhatsApp and Instagram. Through its official media channels, Tehran has accused the Kurdish separatists for the unrest in the country. But unless the Ibrahim Raisi administration can address the concerns raised by the youth and provide justice to Masa Amini, whose death has jolted the conscience of the Iranian nation, 
these protests won't die down anytime soon. The Sagaing region in Myanmar's northwest has witnessed some of the most intense fighting ever since the military junta orchestrated the coup last year. And this week, in an incident that has sent shockwaves across the country, the military junta carried out an air attack on a school, claiming that it had received a tip-off that insurgents of the Kachin Independence Army, an ethnic insurgent group, were using the school as a base for their activities. To deal with this, the junta dispatched two military helicopters for an air attack. The helicopters sprayed the school premises with bullets with heavy machine guns. A total of 13 people were killed, of which 11 are said to be children. Our next report gets you more details. A half-opened school bag lying next to dried bloodstains on the floor. A damaged rooftop and a shattered wooden ceiling. A burnt vehicle standing within the monastery. Debris and soot covering the floor. And an inconsolable mother sobbing next to the dead body of her son. These tragic and heartrending images narrate a tale of violence, oppression and the excesses committed by Myanmar's military junta. On Friday, the 16th of September, two government helicopters fired machine guns and heavy weapons indiscriminately at a school in a Buddhist monastery in the village of Let Yet Khon. The school had 240 young students, from kindergarten to grade 8, who were taught by about 20 volunteer teachers. In an hour-long shooting mayhem that ensued, at least 11 children and two adults were brutally killed. This is the deadliest attack on children in Myanmar in a single day since the military junta ousted the elected civilian government of Aung San Suu Kyi in February 2021. Myanmar's military-ruled government, however, brazenly has said it targeted the rebels hiding in the area and has accused the media of distorting the truth. The terrorist so-called People's Defense Force and the Kachin Independence Army forced the people to stay under the main building of the monastery. Then they started firing on the security forces while using the villagers as human shields. We had to shoot back at them. <laughs> the military regime has been battling pro-democracy insurgents since the coup and has killed nearly 2,300 civilians in its crackdown on dissent since then. The Sagaing region in the country's northwest has witnessed some of the fiercest fighting. Armed with little more than homemade weapons and using the knowledge of the local terrain to their advantage, some of these anti-coup groups have surprised the military with their effectiveness. But guerrilla attacks on junta troops and assassination of pro-junta officials is often followed by bloody reprisals. Massacres and burning of villages considered sympathetic to the rebels' cause has become a recurring feature. Consequently, more than half a million people have been displaced in the Sagaing region since the coup. Schools are generally considered off-limits even during periods of conflict, and attacks on them are a contravention of international humanitarian laws. But with the recent airstrike, the military junta of Myanmar has crossed the red line. A Palestinian man was killed at a traffic junction between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv on the 23rd of September. According to the Israeli police, who shot the Palestinian man dead, he reportedly got out of his car at a traffic light near the city of Modi'in in Israel, which borders the occupied West Bank, and began stabbing and firing pepper spray at passengers in nearby cars. An Israeli border police officer in plain clothes fired several shots at the Palestinian, killing him on the spot. Yemen's Houthi forces displayed their land-based anti-ship missiles, drones and mines at a military parade in Hodeida on the 23rd of September. About 25,000 soldiers of the Houthi army, navy and air forces participated in the parade. 
the largest one held by the Houthis since a ceasefire brokered by the United Nations came into force in April. The UN mission deployed to oversee the deal between the Yemeni government and the Houthis on the cessation of hostilities and the mutual redeployment of forces in Hodeidah said it was deeply concerned by the military parade. The civil war in the Tigray province of Ethiopia is likely to get worse. The Tigray forces have accused the Eritrean armed forces of launching a full-scale offensive. Just last week, the Tigray rebel forces had been suing for peace with the federal government of Abi Ahmed in Ethiopia, expressing their willingness that they would accept the mediation by the African Union. Russian nuclear-powered submarines fired cruise missiles in the Arctic as part of military drills designed to test Moscow's readiness for a possible conflict in its icy northern waters. The drills, codenamed Umka 2022, took place in the Chukchi Sea, an eastern stretch of the Arctic Ocean that separates Russia from Alaska of the United States. Russia sees its vast Arctic territory as of vital strategic interest and has been building up its military capabilities in the region for years. At the conclusion of this episode, I want to leave you with these images that will make you sit up and think. War, remember, is fought not just on the battlefield. When the Americans were fighting the Taliban, the cameras of the world were revetted for wall-to-wall -wall coverage of America's spectacular new types of bombs that were rained down on the mountains of Afghanistan. There was not a day when Afghanistan was not in the headlines, when the heavily armed American soldiers were fighting the Taliban. But the Americans have now left, and they've also left behind their weapons for the Taliban to use. But a new type of fighters have now emerged for still fighting the Taliban. And they say they have no choice but to fight the Taliban as the world has forgotten and even abandoned them. This video from the Paktika province of Afghanistan is doing the rounds on social media. And it shows a group of young school girls whose school has been shut since the time the Taliban stormed to power. Their only demand is that their girls' school should be reopened. Perhaps no one will be required to fight the Taliban harder and for longer than these young girls. The world's attention has moved away from Afghanistan. It is no longer the hot topic of news coverage. The battles which these young girls will have to fight against the Taliban for their education will have to be fought all alone by them and by their families. And often it is these battles that are the hardest to fight. Thanks for watching World at War. And if you want to reach out to me with any suggestions or comments or feedback, please feel free to tweet to me on the Twitter handle that you see on your screens. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week.